Our uh, presentation this evening is on the apocryphal books of the Maccabees. And there's actually lots and lots of books of Maccabees. And so we're going to have the ones, I'm sorry, the two of them that are actually in what Protestants call the Apocrypha. So this will be first and second Maccabees, but I'll talk about the other books of Maccabees a little bit too. And then we're going to talk about the history, underlying history of the Maccabees so that we can kind of evaluate the quality and historicity of the books of Maccabees, first and second Maccabees. So Apocrypha. Um, what is this word? It's a medieval Latin word. Our word Apocrypha comes from Apocryphus, which means hidden, and that is just a pretty quick, uh, easy borrow word from Apocryphos, uh, which is a Greek word, which means obscure. It's kind of very similar meaning. And um, Apocrypha sounds really cool. It sounds a lot like apocalypse, even though it's not <laughs> the same word. And so um, uh, it's a great title. However, the reality is, is that the biblical books that we call the Apocrypha are actually never really hidden or, I mean, I guess they could be obscure books, but they were not lost books. So these are not the same as lost books of the Bible, despite their title. Um, just by way of overall context, if we think of the Hebrew Bible, or for Christians, we think of the Old Testament of the Bible, um, whereas it's published all together in one book, and often it's published all together with the Old and New Testaments in one big, long, extended volume. And for many English speakers, if they are reading the old King James translation of that, it also sort of all sounds the same, has kind of a uh, old-timey shakespeare style talk. Um, it can allow people to sort of think of it as being all one book and maybe even as if it was written together. And in fact, when you get to the end of the book of Revelation, it says nothing should be added or taken away from this book. A lot of people imagine that, that means from the whole Bible. But in fact, that just is talking about that one book, Revelation, which was uh, not written with any idea in mind that it would ever be part of this larger book that we would call the Bible. And indeed, of the, all the books that came into the Bible, which are indicated here in this diagram with all these scrolls, in fact, there were many very similar texts <laughs> uh, that were not included, um, both in the New Testament and uh, the Old Testament time period when these were written. So the extended set of Bible-like books, you know, the ones that did not make it into anyone's canon of Scripture. So in other words, they're not in the Jewish Bible and they are not in Orthodox or Catholic or Protestant Bibles. This larger collection of texts is sometimes called pseudepigrapha, and that means uh, texts or writings that are falsely attributed. So um, the idea here is that these books that we talked about, books of Enoch, Enoch, um, that those books are um, attributed to the antediluvian character, a character that lived between Adam and Noah before the flood. Um, even though they're supposedly written by uh, that character, in fact, they are written much more recently. They are not um, written by Enoch. Enoch is not a historical person. Uh, is a, a mythological, biblical character. Um, and, uh, and so therefore, these writings are falsely attributed. Nevertheless, um, even though we call these writings a pseudepigrapha, some of them aren't pseudepigraphic. So in some cases, there will be a Bible-like um, uh, text that will be written by somebody who just wasn't important enough to make, make it into the canon. So like a letter of Clement, a very important early Christian writer, uh, and his text doesn't make it in, but it's not actually falsely attributed. Likewise, many of the books that do make it into the Bible have actually been shown to be pseudepigraphic. So, for example, um, books like the Gospels that are attributed to writers like Mark and Matthew, uh, Matthew, one of Jesus' apostles, according to the Gospels anyway, um, is not the writer is not the author of the Gospel of Matthew, as we've seen. It's an anonymous text that was attributed to one of Jesus' apostles, in the case of Matthew. Um, likewise, the five texts uh, of the Pentateuch, or the Jewish Torah, um, are attributed 
to Moses, but they were not written by Moses. And so in other words, there are a lot of pseudepigraphic texts within the canon. So this, this is also just like the word apocrypha doesn't really, isn't really meaningful, even though we use that as kind of a blanket term. So um, for Catholics and Orthodox Christians, because what Protestants call the apocrypha um, is actually part of their canon. So in other words, it's actually, these books are actually in, not the pseudepigrapha, but the apocrypha are actually in the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles, and as a result, they call these texts the deuterocanonical texts, and deutero is just Greek here for second canon, so deuterocanonical. Uh, and so when we take a look at these books, this kind of collection of books, Judith, Tobit, Additions to Esther, the book Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, the Letter of Jeremiah, Additions to the Book of Daniel, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, 1st Esdras, the Prayer of Manasseh, the 151st Psalm, 3rd Maccabees, 2nd Esdras, and 4th Maccabees. So a lot of Maccabees books you can see in there. Um, this is kind of the question of whether or not they make it into the canon. And so we see all the way down through 2nd Maccabees, those are all considered to be deuterocanonical, or in other words, part of the Bible as far as Catholics are concerned. Uh, the Greek Church, the Greek Orthodox Church, has it all the way to 3rd Maccabees. The Russians apparently have 2nd Edras in, in there as well. Putting some of these stars here because there are, the Protestants again call the Apocrypha. They'll still be translated in the King James Version and they'll be in a lot of people's Bibles under the heading Apocrypha. And so it's not that Protestants are unaware of these books or that, that they're hidden or obscure, but um, they aren't technically part of the canon. And none of them are part of the Jewish canon in rabbinic Judaism. I just want to start with a little bit of context. And so I made this chart of chronology of the Second Temple period of Judaism, which runs from the destruction of the First Temple, Solomon's Temple, the destruction of the original independent kingdom of Judah in 586, when the Babylonians destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple and take the uh, exiles, uh, Jewish elite, the Judean elite, off to um, Babylon. And that's called the period of the Babylonian captivity. Um, the temple is then destroyed during that captivity period when the Persians conquer the Babylonian Empire. Uh, Cyrus, the Persian emperor, proclaims uh, the right um, to return for the, uh, the Judeans who can go back now to a province within the Persian Empire, Judea or Yehud in Persian. And he gives them funds and helps them rebuild the temple. And so by 516 BCE, the second temple is complete. Um, and in that time period, it's continued to be worked on and Jerusalem's continued to be worked on as kind of a minor province and poor province within the Persian Empire. And during that time, uh, one of the great um, leaders in, in Jerusalem, Ezra, um, is known to have read the Torah uh, kind of for the first time. And so a lot of, and it's part of a celebration that is had out loud and people hear in it things that they'd never heard before. And so as a result, um, many scholars kind of think that Ezra might have been the redactor that put the Torah together into its present form, in other words, edited earlier texts to bring them all together into uh, the, what we now have as the Torah or Pentateuch. Uh, shortly thereafter, um, the last Old Testament book that is sort of not pseudepigraphic, Malachi, is, is written. And then we just think biblically, um, it's many centuries later uh, the, during the Maccabee period that the book of Daniel is actually written, although Daniel pretends to be written uh, four centuries before it was. And so in other words, it's by a per person who was living at the time of the Babylonian captivity, but it's written much, much later. And then again, like I say, it's between the Testaments. The early Christian, earliest Christians' writings are in the 50s of the, of the uh, first century of the common era, the Christian era. So in between all of these things, um, uh, what ends up happening is Alexander the Great uh, invades the Persian Empire and overthrows the Persian Empire. And so suddenly, from being a relatively uh, happy province within Persia, where the 
Judeans and the Persians are getting along pretty well. Um, they're now the, um, the Judeans find themselves uh, under the control or under the rule of the, a new Greek or Hellenistic empire. Um, after Alexander dies, his empire is split into pieces. Initially, the area um, around Jerusalem, Judea, falls into the Egyptian realm. So that's the period of Ptolemaic rule, where the Ptolemies, uh, these Macedonian pharaohs that are descended from Alexander's general Ptolemy, rule over both Egypt and Judea. And then around the year 200 BCE, 198, um, the leader of the Seleucids, who had been another one of these great successors of Alexander, Antiochus III, seizes uh, Jerusalem and Judea from the Ptolemies, and thereafter um, it becomes into the sphere of the Seleucids. Uh, during the Seleucid rule, um, there is a, uh, an incident where Antiochus' uh, successor, Antiochus IV, sacks Jerusalem, this leads to a revolt known as the Maccabean Revolt, which leads to kind of a autonomous kind of rebel group of uh, a Jewish pre-kingdom, which uh, eventually, as the uh, Seleucid Empire further collapses, achieves actual independence. But that independence is happening in the backdrop of the emerging um, power of Rome as Rome slowly uh, conquers and annexes all of the Hellenistic kingdoms and so forth. And so by the end of the Hasmonean kingdom, the Hasmoneans are in fact actually uh, subjects of Rome. And at a certain point, the uh, Roman Senate uh, decrees that um, uh, essentially that the kingdom was now going to be ruled instead of Hasmoneans by uh, one of the Maccabees, in other words, is ruled instead by uh, the son of one of their great nobles, Herod the Great. We've had a whole um, lecture already on, on Herod the Great, but essentially the, the Romans are so powerful that they can decide whether, for example, this kingdom will just become a province or whether it's going to continue to be a kingdom, but they can decide who's the king of it and so forth. Okay, so let's uh, go back into this era, this Hellenistic era post-Alexander. Uh, so one of the things that Alexander the Great did was go around spreading uh, Greek ideas, Greek culture, Greek philosophy, Greek literature, language, and so forth. And, <clears throat> and part of the agenda, uh, because uh, Greek society was inherently uh, around the polis, and the whole idea of politics and everything like that means uh, life in the polis was going around and fo uh, founding Greek cities. And so in some cases, these are foundations that are made from scratch, like Alexandria and Egypt. There's lots and lots of other cities that Alexander founds, and he names them all after himself, Alexandria. Uh, uh, but in some cases, an existing city will be refounded and renamed. Uh, and so well, it may, might have been, um, you know, so a city, it might have been named, uh, you know, let's, I'm not going to say which one it would be. Like, so like if it was a dim name, Damascus originally, and then if it's refounded, they'll call it, you know, Alexandria, you know, Damascene Alexandria or something like that. And that's not an example of one that actually happened. But essentially the um, uh, first Alexander and then his successors, the Ptolemies, the Antigonids, the Seleucids, and so forth, um, create cities that are named Alexandria, Ptolemais, uh, Antioch, and Seleucia, and so forth. And within uh, Egypt, actually, um, Alexandria becomes the uh, greatest, uh, uh, the center of the largest Judean community in the world. So under the Ptolemies, who are the pharaohs in Egypt, but who are in fact a, a Macedonian or Greek, Northern Greek dynasty, they create a new capital of Egypt. It becomes the largest, most cosmopolitan city in the whole Greek-speaking world and the greatest center of Greek culture and teachings, famous for its library and museum and schools and so forth. Like I say, it's also the uh, center of the largest uh, Judean community. And um, the Alexandrian Judeans uh, are very busily um, engaging in Hellenistic culture. And so uh, one of the things that they do is they take this text that is so important to them, the Hebrew Bible, and they begin to translate it into Greek. 
And so the Septuagint translation, as it is called, is the early Greek translation. We get the name Septuagint from the Greek word for 70. It's a translation into Greek beginning in the third century, traditionally by 70 or 72 scholars. And so there's a lot of um, mythology about this that the scholars all gather together and are more or less inspired uh, by God and come up with the same translation and so forth. So in other words, that we know that the, it's, uh, the idea of it is it's word for word. It turns out that the textual analysis shows that that's not how it was done, that these in fact were translated over time. Um, there's a similar story about the King James Bible translators as well because it's, it's just a kind of a good story to have when you are worrying about uh, the authority of scripture, but in both cases these are mythological stories. But essentially um, the Septuagint drew from a large body of Hebrew writings, some of which are in Aramaic, but mostly all Hebrew, that included books of the law, so that's the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then there are books of history, and so this is the uh, Deuteronomic history, so Joshua, uh, Judges, First and Second Samuels, First and Second Kings, but then also uh, books set in that time period like Ruth, um, books like First and Second Chronicles, which are a later um, redaction of the Deuteronomic history, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, which are a, a two-part history of the kind of Second Temple period, the rebuilding of the temple, and so forth, and then these uh, books that have become uh, apocrypha uh, in the, in, for the Protestants and outside of the canon uh, for, for Jews, Tobit, Judith, Maccab the Maccabees books, and so forth. On top of that, then, in addition to the law and history books are the wisdom books, which include Psalms, the Book of Job, Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, then Ecclesiasticus, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, and so forth. Um, so in other words, on here you can kind of see earlier and later is the different color scheme, and then prophets. The book of the minor prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Baruch, Lamentations, letter of Jeremiah, Ecclesiastes, Daniel, and so forth. So even though we have all of those that are included in the Septuagint, I just want to point out that there are many more <laughs> ancient Jewish texts that are scripture-like and were considered scripture to some ancient Jews. So in other words, they were not... Um, uh, included in this canon and they weren't translated and so forth, uh, but they were still nevertheless um, some group that might that revered them and used them and so forth. Um, there were many first century Hellenistic Jews in the diaspora, which is to say people who were not living in the area around Jerusalem, um, but who were living instead in around the Hellenistic world, especially like I said in Alexandria, and they did not know Hebrew, um, even in even in Judea, they mostly now start, have spoken, start speaking Aramaic and so forth, which is a related language, but different language. And the ones in the, uh, the Greek speaking ones use the Septuagint as their scripture. And so they, that included obviously these deuterocanonical books, the apocryphal books. However, even in Aramaic speaking Judea, some Jews considered some of these texts to be part of their canon. So for example, um, we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there is a Jewish sect known as the Essenes, uh, and they have a kind of a quasi-monastic retreat area in Qumran where they have been keeping a lot of texts which were um, uh, buried away and in, in, uh, became buried away and in, in, in stored and preserved, and those are known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. So three of these uh, texts, Tobit, Sirach, and so Jeremiah are included among the Dead Sea Scrolls, so even though they do not fit into the later Jewish canon. Um, meanwhile, also, um, Christians also consider the Septuagint to be uh, canon. So the Christian Bible, the New Testament, is written in Greek, uh, even though uh, the spoken language of Jesus was Aramaic. So we don't have any of Jesus speaking, in the wor speaking words in his original I mean, his original words that he would have said, because any Aramaic versions or Syriac versions that we have of gospel texts are actually translated uh, into Aramaic or Syriac from Greek. So the earliest we have is Greek. When the texts have Jesus 
quote the Old Testament. So often when Jesus is walking around in the Gospels, he will um, open a scroll up and he'll quote from uh, the Torah or something like that. When he d- does that, they are not recalling him quoting the Hebrew, which they then translate to the Greek. So in other words, it's not that the Gospel writer is themselves thinking, oh, he would have said this in in Hebrew, and I'm just going to now translate that off the top of my head into Greek while I'm writing this Greek text. What the authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do is they go to the place in the Septuagint, they look up how it goes in in that, and they simply quote it directly, which is not what Jesus would have been doing. So the point of it is is that um, the New Testament texts are actually dependent on uh, the Greek Uh, Bible, the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint. So, like I say, um, the Septuagint is then also the basis for what becomes the Old Testament for the Christians, uh, the Old Testament canon. So, uh, St. Jerome, who uh, did a translation in the 4th century of the Common Era and made a Latin version, the Vulgate, retained most of the Septuagint's contents and organization even though Jerome called attention to the fact that some of the books and, uh, were not even originally in Hebrew. And so ultimately, um, some Septuagint books then were excluded from the Latin canon, but in general, the, the Septuagint was, ends up being what the uh, original Christian canon is. In part, I think, especially because of the reaction to Greek Christianity, so... So Christianity begins as a Second Temple Jewish sect, um, and Judaism understood itself to be a a universal religion at the time, and still does. Um, And so um, the Jewish Christians uh, went around evangelizing other people who were not Jewish, and so um, they end up converting lots and lots of Gentiles, Greek Gentiles and so forth, and fairly quickly um, Christianity becomes a non-Jewish majority religion, and it then becomes um, its own separate religion from the rest of Judaism. Um, After the destruction of the temple, at the end of the Second Temple period, um, the rabbis reform um, their non-Christian component of Judaism as rabbinic Judaism. And in a lot of cases, because that Christianity has become so Greek-focused and is using the Septuagint as its um, uh, text, Rabbinic Judaism, I think, ceases to use the Septuagint and uh, much of the other Second Temple Jewish texts that were written in Greek. So when they assembled their canon, the rabbis eliminated most of the texts that were written in the later uh, Second Temple period, and the exception to that is the Book of Daniel, which I already mentioned. It kind of squeaks in because the people thought it was written much earlier, even though it's uh, it's, even though it's a much later book than it, um, it pretends to be a much earlier book than it is. So for the Hebrew canon, it's much smaller. So it consists specifically of the law, the prophets, and the writings. And so it's organized very differently than how Christians organize the Old Testament, which was organized, like I said before, according to the Septuagint. So we have the five books of the law, the prophets, uh, including the uh, minor prophets, which are brought together in one book in, in the Hebrew Bible, and then the writings, which include things like Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and so forth. So, in the West, when um, Latin Christendom breaks apart in the 16th century during the Protestant Reformation, um, there was a lot more kind of the basis for um, a renewed interest in scholarship. And so, um, uh, and also getting back to original texts and so forth. And so Protestants started going to um, synagogues and looking at the fact that their Jewish uh, neighbors had a different set of books in the Bible than the Protestants had in the Latin Bible. Protestants were interested in bringing the Bible texts into vernacular languages. So the Catholic Church at the time uh, was continuing, for example, in the West to use Latin, which nobody spoke except for as a uh, a scholarly language and an ecclesiastical language. And so the Bible is primarily experienced by um, kind of that literate class that has to learn not only, you know, to read, but also has to learn Latin in order to access these texts. 
So now in this early modern period of time, the emphasis is on, no, we should bring that to everybody. Everybody should be you know, able to read and have a Bible in every home and ultimately, now that we have the advantage of the invention of the printing press and so forth. And so Protestants start translating um, Bibles into German and into English and so forth. Um, and in doing that, they also went back and looked at um, the original texts that are written in Hebrew and Greek rather than simply translating directly or from what they've been using Latin into those languages. So in noting that the Catholic and Jewish canons differ, Protestants ultimately reject the disputed texts from their new canons. So the deuterocanonical books from the Septuagint that are not being used by the Jews are now put into this apocrypha category for Protestants. And so that leaves us with a very particularly peculiar dividing line for the canons. And so the books that don't use the apocrypha are rabbinic Judaism and Protestant Christianity, whereas the ones that do include those same books, which are now are called the, the second canon for these other churches, are the Orthodox and Catholic Christians. If that makes sense. And I just bring all those back so you can kind of see again. These are the books in that category, and it's a little variation between whether they're in the Catholic or Greek you know, uh, versions. Not all of the books that the Greeks consider canon are canon to the Catholics and so forth. Okay, so with that background, let's look at the two books of Maccabees, or the books of Maccabees that are in the Apocrypha, and we'll zero in especially on the first two. So the first book of Maccabees is set in the second century BCE. It was composed a little later than that, maybe into the first century BCE, we're not exactly sure. It is a Greek, it's the text that we have it is in Greek, and it seems to be a Greek translation from a lost Hebrew original. However, that's not entirely, you know, we, we don't have the original, it's lost, and so it's not entirely um, sure that there was a Hebrew original. However, if it, if, if it was written in Greek, it's written with all kinds of um, deliberate Hebraisms. So it's like writing, um, in, it's kind of written old timey too. And so it would be like deliberately writing a new story using, let's say, King James English. So in other words, you read the Bible a lot and you want it to sound Bible-like, and so you write a new text using that same thing. So most likely there's a Hebrew original here, and that's um, why Hebrew um, grammar and format forms are being brought across into Greek, but it's not entirely sure. The author is unknown, but it is because of the context of uh, their perspective. It's probably a very pro-Hasmonean um, when I'm using the word Hasmonean here, so the name Maccabee is one of the names for um, the, the rebel royal house uh, that establishes this rebellion and then independent uh, Judean kingdom. But um, the, the family is also known as the Hasmoneans, and so I'm just using those two words um, interchangeably here. So there's a pro-Hasmonean Jewish writer probably operating in Judea itself probably somebody who is sponsored probably by the, the Hasmonean court because um, it's almost a kind of a propaganda piece for the Hasmoneans. Um, even though this one's called First Maccabees, this is not like a situation like the book of First and Second Kings, which are just two parts of the same book. Um, the way those work, things like First Chronicles and Second Chronicles or First and Second Kings, essentially a scroll can only be so long. And so to make a convenient scroll. And so if it's a long book, you'll have 1 Kings and 2 Kings, which are just essentially the first half and the second half. And that's true for a lot of um, books that have those kind of numbers. Um, but this is totally not true, like we said, for, um, for example, the books of Enoch, or, and it's not true for the books of Maccabees. Essentially, we just have a lot of books that are attributed to Enoch. And so then this, as people started collecting them, they numbered them. Well, this is the first one that I found, and this is the second one that I found, and so forth. And the books of Maccabees are sort of the same. So all of the other books of Maccabees have different authors than this one, which is the story of essentially the revolt and then the kind of immediate aftermath. So the second book of Maccabees is another history of the revolt um, uh, that is also kind of very um, 
well known for this very emblematic story of the martyrdom of a woman and her seven sons, or seven sons followed by her death. Um, this is composed um, kind of in the same time period. It's set just a little bit earlier, and it only and it's shorter though. So even though the first Maccabees um, is called First Maccabees, Second Maccabees actually the beginning of it takes place a little bit before First Maccabees. So this one is said to be a um, abridgment uh, written in Greek, um, but of, of a longer Greek original. So there is um, an the text as we have it is probably an unknown Egyptian Jewish editor, maybe somebody from Alexandria who is redacting or um, shortening, bringing together just the highlights of a lost, much longer original story by um, of an otherwise unknown Jewish um, writer named Jason of Cyrene. So again, somebody from the diaspora who is writing, so not somebody from within Judea. Like I say, it's unrelated to 1st Maccabees, not a sequel of it at all. Um, so within the Apocrypha for um, the Eastern Orthodox and also the Russian Orthodox, um, the Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox is the third book of Maccabees. So um, this is specifically, so even though it's called 3rd Maccabees, it actually takes place before either of the two other books of Maccabees. And so it's meant to be about the persecution of Jews uh, in Judea under Ptolemy the fourth Philopater of Egypt, so in other words, the Macedonian um, uh, pharaoh uh, who is in charge before the Seleucids uh, take Judea over. So in other words, like I said, after um, the disintegration of Alexander's empire, the Ptolemies in Egypt were the ones who were first in charge of Judea, and then it switches right before the Maccabean revolt. And so this uh, text is set just a little bit before the other ones. Uh, it's composed much later though, or it's composed around the same time, but anyway, much later than it's set. Um, uh, written again in Greek. It's very well written from a stylistic standpoint in terms of the Greek, Jewish writer from Egypt. Uh, however, this one probably doesn't have much historicity to it at all. It's more like a romance, and in some ways it's a prequel for the character of Eleazar the scribe who is martyred in the book of 2 Maccabees um, a little bit before uh, the, that woman and her seven sons. And we'll look at that. Uh, then there's a fourth book of Maccabees, <laughs> and this one is a kind of a, a philosophical dialogue about the woman and her seven sons who are martyred in 2 Maccabees. This one is also titled On the Sovereignty of Reason. Um, it's set then just at that time period when the woman is martyred and composed probably in the first century of the Common Era, probably by a Greek-speaking Jew who might be from Syria, so not somebody maybe from Judea or Egypt in this case. And then there's more books of Maccabees, if you can imagine how many Maccabee books you need. So these are unrelated books uh, that aren't scripture for anybody. So 5th Maccabees as it's titled. Again, these weren't titled 5th Maccabees originally. This is what, how scholars write them out. 5th Maccabees is an Arabic text, actually, that follows uh, Hasmonean history uh, you know, from a later period, so it's a continuation. 6th um, Maccabees is a Syriac poem about the Maccabean martyrs, you know, the, the seven sons and their mother. The 7th Maccabees is Syriac text of the speeches of those martyrs. So you can see that that's a theme that people come back to, that they're very interested in. And finally, uh, 8th Maccabees is essentially a brief Greek text of the revolt that apparently draws on Seleucid sources as opposed to um, uh, the Hasmonean sources like 1st Maccabees does. Okay, so let's look at 1st Maccabees. Here's the plot in short. The Seleucid king Antiochus IV Epiphanes, so this is the Macedonian uh, king who is an heir to the greatest of Alexander's kingdoms, a kingdom that stretches from uh, what's now Turkey, Anatolia, across Syria and Iraq, uh, and all across Persia to Bactria originally, although by the time Antiochus gets a hold of it, um, it's uh, much diminished. So the book of Maccabees, right at the beginning, he is, this guy is the villain, and he is described as a sinful root in his, uh, as he inherits Judea. 
some local Judeans uh, described as the, by the author of 1 Maccabees as being certain renegades. So this is not renegades against Seleucids. This is renegades against the uh, Jewish people in the understanding of the book of Maccabees author. They decide to make a covenant with the Gentiles, in other words, with foreigners, with the Greek-speaking people, and they begin to participate in Hellenistic and Greek culture. Uh, Antiochus IV, as he's attempting to invade Egypt and take uh, borderlands between uh, himself and Ptolemy, and maybe even take Egypt, um, he defeats Ptolemy, but, um, but is pushed back ultimately, and on the way home, he sacks uh, Jerusalem. Um, and so here's what we read in 1 Maccabees about uh, the forced Hellenization of the kingdom. So Antiochus uh, decrees a policy of Hellenization or assimilation for his kingdom. Uh, as we read in the text, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people, that all should give up their particular customs, and all the Gentiles accepted the command of the king. Many, even in Israel, gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent letters by messengers to Jerusalem and all the towns of Judah, and he directed them to follow customs strange to the land, to forbid burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuary, to profane Sabbaths and festivals, to defile the sanctuary and the priests, to build altars and sacred precincts and shrines for idols, to sacrifice swine and other clean animals, and to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane so that they would forget the law and change all the ordinances. He added, the king added that is, and whoever does not obey the command of the king shall die. So um, this is essentially a full on attack as you can see on, uh, on Jewish practice uh, as described here anyway in 1 Maccabees. And um, it is kind of presented as something that um, Antiochus is, uh, is deciding to do for his entire kingdom. However, we don't actually have any evidence for that uh, for any other part of the kingdom. So in other words, um, in retrospect, the author of First Maccabees is identifying this as a general suppression of everybody's local customs and a forced Hellenization. Um, but in fact, uh, we don't have evidence for that anywhere else in the Seleucid Empire, um, and we'll see why maybe that is. But essentially, many of the Judeans do follow this royal decree, according to the book of Macca First Maccabees, and we know that they do actually from other sources. They forsake Jewish law and what's called a desolating sacri uh, sacrilege. An idol is set up uh, in the Jerusalem temple altar, uh, the book describes that the books of Torah are burned and also nonconformists, people who do not obey this new law, as the king said, uh, they will die. They are executed according to the text. However, some Judeans, it says, chose to die rather than to profane the holy covenant. Um, and in the text here, opposition emerges in the country town of Modin, led by a priest named Mattathias. Uh, who is said to be the son of John, the son of Simon, a priest of the family of Jehorib. And Mattathias has five sons, Judas called the Maccabeus, uh, Jonathan, uh, it's not spelled right, Appius, Jonathan Appius, Simon Thassi, along with Simon's son, John Hyrcanus, who begin a military campaign against the Seleucids and against um, their fellow countrymen, the Jews who have become Hellenized. So, um, they found a relatively pragmatic guerrilla insurgency. So because initially um, they are all very much committed to obeying Jewish law, the Greeks and the Hellenized Jews take advantage of that and they attack them on the Sabbath. And that allows them to massacre a thousand of the rebels and their families on a Saturday. And so that leads Mattathias to decide, quote, in the book here of, of Maccabees, let us fight against anyone who comes to attack us on the Sabbath. Let's not all die as our kindred died in their hiding places. So, so 
during the whole insurgency, <coughs> this kind of pragmatic guerrilla insurgency, even though it's um, fighting uh, in order to preserve the law, they kind of make the uh, pragmatic decision. Yeah, but we're still going to fight on the Sabbath because we don't want to get massacred. We want to be able to win this thing. So then they're united with a company of Hasidians, mighty warriors of Israel, all who offered themselves willingly for the law, and all who became fugitives to escape their troubles joined them and reinforced them. So he starts gathering a huge kind of guerrilla insurgency army. They organized an army, the text goes on to say, and they struck down sinners in their anger and renegades in their wrath. The survivals fled to the Gentiles for safety, and Mattathias and his friends went around and tore down the altars. They forcibly circumcised all the uncircumcised boys that they found within the borders of Israel. They hunted down the arrogant, and work, the work prospered in their hands. They rescued the law out of the hands of the Gentiles and kings, and they never let a sinner, gave, the sinner gain the upper hand. So in other words, the rebels now, um, in the same way that there was forced Hellenization on the other side, now there's forced adherence to Jewish law, forced circumcisions, and so forth. Um, and then on his deathbed in the text, Mattathias compares the revolt to his heroic stories um, that are in the Hebrew Bible, so David and Abraham and other precedents, and he passes command to his sons. So uh, the next to take charge is Judas Maccabeus, uh, this maybe means Judah the Hammer, and his brothers, they lead rebel warriors into a number of battles against the Seleucid armies of Antiochus IV and his Hellenized Jewish allies. Their upset victory is compared by the text uh, to such precedents as David defeating Goliath, and also God's destruction of the armies of Pharaoh when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. So Judas Maccabeus and his rebels defeat the Seleucids and they take Jerusalem for the rebels. We read in the text, then Judas and his brothers said, see, our enemies are crushed. Let us go up to cleanse the sanctuary of the temple and dedicate it. So all the armies assembled and went up to Mount Zion. There they saw the sanctuary desolate, the altar profaned, and the gates burned. He chose blameless priests devoted to the law, and they cleansed the sanctuary and removed the defiled stones to an unclean place. So then removing all the pagan trappings, the rebels build a new altar and reconsecrate the temple according to their understanding of Jewish law. Um, the text then goes on to describe the origins of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Um, so one of the few festivals that are uh, in the Jewish calendar that is uh, later, from this later period, as opposed to the biblical period within the rabbinic um, uh, canon. So then Judas and his brothers and all the army of Israel determined that every year at that season, the days of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of Shislev. So there's a that's the story from 1st Maccabees, and there's a longer version of the Hanukkah story in 2nd Maccabees. So the Maccabees continue to fight against the Seleucids and their Hellenized Jewish allies. So there's a civil war component to this, but there's also um, a component of uh, fighting against their overlords. They're not independent yet, but they have, because of their rebellion, a degree of um, autonomy against uh, the surrounding Seleucid kingdom. Meanwhile, the rise of the Roman Republic as a power intervening in the whole Hellenistic East. Romans totally control the Western Mediterranean, have now been conquering Macedonia, Greece, and into Anatolia, and so forth, and they're now putting pressure on uh, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies as well. That causes the Maccabees to get recognition, look for recognition and alliance from Rome. The Romans are pretty open to that. It's part of a um, a general policy of divide and conquer, so the stronger powers like the Seleucids and the Ptolemies suffer because the Romans give legitimacy to um, smaller powers that are breaking off from them. And so um, Judas Maccabeus is followed by his brothers Jonathan and later Simon as 
Uh, again, not king yet, but great high priest, governor, or ethnarch, leader of a people of the Judeans. So they're both high priest and kind of governor. As you can kind of see in this um, uh, little map originally, um, under Judas Maccabeus, there's just a very tiny area around Jerusalem, which is their sort of autonomous zone, to which then his successor, his brother Jonathan, uh, extends the conquests a little, including uh, conquering the Perea, a little region across uh, the Jordan River. Jonathan gets captured, and so then he's followed by Simon as leader. Fi Simon both fortifies Jerusalem and takes the port city of Joppa, which is helpful. That means that you can connect into uh, the Mediterranean and the Roman world and so forth. He institutes a period of relative peace and prosperity before being murdered by an agent of the Seleucids. Simon uh, is succeeded as leader and high priest by his son, who is in power as the narrative of 2 Maccabees draws to a close. So you can see it's kind of about the early phases of the rebellion, uh, first book of Maccabees. In some, first Maccabees has sort of a sense of being a court-sponsored history. So in other words, something that's coming out of the Hasmonean court. It upholds the claims of the Maccabee dynasty, the Hasmonean dynasty, comparing them all to past biblical leaders. Um, and this is despite the fact that um, the Hasmonean family doesn't have any descent from important um, biblical lineages. So they're neither of the line of the high priests, uh, David's high priest being Zadok. And so those descendants of Zadok, the Zadokites or the Sadducees, have a strong claim to be to the high priesthood, which now the Hasmoneans have without right of lineage. And they also are leaders of the people, initially ethnarchs, but later kings, despite the fact that they also don't have the Davidic lineage, um, that it be the royal house of uh, Judah prior to its destruction by the Babylonians. The text is pretty highly partisan. So it's very much uh, against Hellenized Judeans, who it sees as traitors, and it sees the Hasmoneans as champions of traditionalism. And that becomes ironic, actually, as the history goes on, as we'll see when we look at the kind of context of the Hasmonean kingdom as it becomes an independent Hellenistic kingdom, ultimately. And so ultimately, um, First Maccabees is an interesting and important book not only for getting a glimpse into uh, Judaism and Judaism as it's existing in Judea, as opposed to Babylon or Alexandria at this time, but it's also, um, the, the, this revolt is actually the, um, the best documented revolt that we have within um, the Seleucid kingdom in general. So as the Seleucid kingdom is, is falling apart, there's all kinds of rebel groups that are breaking off and, and uh, uh, areas that are becoming autonomous or independent, and we just simply don't have uh, like con close to contemporary narratives that are detailed about how that process works. So this is our best documented um, revolt that's going on within the Hellenistic world, not the least of which is because we actually have a second contemporary book um, that is also discussing it that has a different perspective. And so we have a very different book of Maccabees, 2 Maccabees, which, as I say, is unrelated to 1 Maccabees, and it wasn't originally called 2 Maccabees. The narrative, as I said, also begins, it actually begins chronologically before the start of 1 Maccabees, but it covers a much shorter period of time. Uh, in contrast to 1 Maccabees, which was written from somebody inside Judea and probably somebody who is patronized by the um, Hasmonean dynasty itself. This is written by a Jew uh, in Egypt, probably, in exile, in other words, part of the, not exile, in, in the diaspora community, somebody from uh, outside uh, the Judean uh, homeland. So, like 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees gives us insight into the conflict as a civil war that is taking place between Hellenized and traditionalist Jews. But it's much more evident in 2 Maccabees that this is also a division between 
um, Hellenized urban Jews that are living in Jerusalem and then the rural Jews in the countryside surround who are not participating in, in the life of the polis, they're not in the city life, and they are therefore um, less, uh, less participating in Greek and Hellenistic culture. So at the outset uh, of the story, which I, like I say, takes place before the Maccabean revolt, um, the high priests in Jerusalem are from a Judean family, a Jewish family called the Oniads, who they already have been pretty Hellenized. They all have Greek names like Jason uh, and Menelaus, <laughs> and they are already serving as officials under the Seleucids, and they are um, able to interact with the Seleucid court, and they know court procedures because they're uh, continuously bribing uh, the king of the Seleucids in order to um, have themselves, you know, assert their candidacy, having themselves be named high priest and deposing their brother and so forth. So in 2 Maccabees we read, when Seleucus died and Antiochus IV, who is called Epiphanes, succeeded to the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Ananias, obtained the high priesthood by corruption promising the king at an interview 360 talents of silver and from another source of revenue, 80 talents. It's a huge sum of money. So in order to become high priest and therefore leader of the province, still under the control of the Seleucid king. In addition to this, uh, he, Jason, the would-be high priest, the Jewish guy, uh, Hellenized Jewish guy here, has promised to pay 150 more if the king gives permission to establish by his authority a gymnasium and a body of use for it and to enroll the people of Jerusalem as citizens of, quote, Antioch. So when the king assented and Jason came to office, he at once shifted his compatriots over to the Greek way of life. He set aside the existing royal concessions to the Jews and he destroyed the lawful ways of living and introduced new customs contrary to the law. He took delight in establishing a gymnasium right under the citadel, so right by the Temple Mount, and induced the noblest of the young men to wear the Greek hat. There was such an extreme of Hellenization and increase in the adoption of foreign ways because of the surpassing wickedness of Jason, who was ungodly and no true high priest, that the priests were no longer intent upon their service at the altar, so they stopped doing all of the maintenance of Jewish law and they go start to participate in the gymnasium and the games and all these other kinds of Greek honors and so forth. So, um, in other words, the high priest himself, um, who already has taken a Greek name uh, and is part of, and is playing the life of a, a Hellenistic noble, um, has a program of Hellenization. So Jason is the, actually renames the city of Jerusalem Antioch. So I was saying how um, in some cases the uh, Hellenistic conquerors like Alexander would found a new city and name it Alexandria. In other cases, they would take an old city and they would refound it and they would call it Alexandria. Or in this case, because uh, it's a Seleucid city, it's being called Antioch after uh, the general Antioch, Antiochus. And so Jerusalem now becomes a Hellenized city and amongst it is a gymnasium which is to say a school and athletic campus where Judean youth can be taught Greek athletics, warfare, uh, and so forth, and also philosophy, Greek learning, and so forth. So we also um, have now uh, moralizing or an understanding of the theology of the author of 2 Maccabees. So uh, the author writes, despising the temple sanctuary and neglecting the sacrifices, the priests hurried to take part in the unlawful proceedings in the wrestling arena after the signal for the discus throwing, disdain, disdaining the honors prized by their ancestors and putting the highest value on Greek forms of prestige. And for this reason, heavy disaster overtook them and those whose ways of living they admired and wished to imitate completely became their enemies and punished them. So in other words, even though they're um, sucking up to the Greeks or they're admiring the Greeks or whatever, they're ultimately going to um, be punished by the Greeks in, in war, and it's because uh, um, God is punishing them as in, the, in the mind here of the author of 2 Maccabees. 
It is no light thing to show a reverence to the divine laws. So in other words, the fact that they are forsaking Jewish law is a problem, a fact that later events will make clear, the author of 2 Maccabees promises us. So 2 Maccabees gives a different context for uh, king Antiochus, uh, the Seleucid king's raid on the temple. So um, as we said, that was sort of like just something that kind of happens in the first book and that sparks the revolt. In this case, there's some additional context ahead of time in 2 Maccabees. So Jason, the high priest, and his brothers have been bribing and counter-bribing uh, each other so that they're getting replaced, who's going to be the high priest and so forth. And when, when they're out of power, they take up arms against each other in order to try to seize the high priesthood from one another. And so um, on his way back from Egypt, Antiochus, who's been leading an army against Ptolemy, he sees that there is this armed dispute going on between the brothers, and he assumes that to be a revolt. In other words, that's a fight, and he assumes that they're revolting against his authority. And so he responds by sending his army, he's got his army marching anyway, so they march back via Jerusalem, which they storm, they enter the temple, and because like all ancient temples, this is a source of where people have been giving alms and so forth, this is a place where people store uh, the local treasury, it's where people store valuables, ancient temples are banks, and one of the reasons why um, uh, banks even today look like ancient Greek temples is because of the association of temples with banks anyway. So the temple has a lot of treasure and um, Antiochus then plunders the treasury. Um, after this then we read in second book of Maccabees that Antiochus decides to impose uh, religious syncretism on the people. So not long after this we read, the king, Antiochus IV, sent an Athenian senator, senator. so he gets a, 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 a sophisticated person from Athens, a cultural leader here, to compel the Jews to forsake the laws of their ancestor and no longer to live by the laws of God. Also to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Olympian Zeus. So in other words, it has just been the Jerusalem temple, the temple to the God whose name is not um, said by uh, the people who are uh, the adherents. Now that God is understood to also be Olympian Zeus. And to the call the one in Mount Gezerim, the temple of Zeus, the friend of strangers, uh, as did the people who lived in that place. And so this other temple at Mount Gezerim, this is uh, the Samaritan temple. So it is also um, being identified, the God who's worshipped there, the God of Israel, is being identified with Zeus. So syncretism is part of a broader trend in the Hellenistic period. So local national gods like Yahweh or Baal or Ammon in Egypt or Jupiter among the Romans are understood by this idea of syncretism as being simply a different understanding for the same supreme sky father god Zeus uh, for the Greeks as the Greeks understood that god. And so we got, we've had a whole lecture on um, Roman mythology and how Roman religion or Roman, the old gods of Roman religion differ from uh, Greek mythology but how the stories get syncretized together to the point where um, you know Venus we just think of Venus as being Aphrodite and Mars as being Aries and so forth, even though uh, in Hephaestus is Vulcan, even though the, um, they had very different origins originally and they got syncretized together. So um, while some of the elite Judeans uh, conformed to Greek customs and welcomed them, others uh, refused and and. Second Maccabees, they are said to be martyred, including the scribe Eleazar, who chooses death rather than to, um, he's being called upon to eat uh, unclean sacrificial animals, uh, you know, or eat pork, for example. Or, um, actually, actually, everybody around him kind of urges him, just pretend to eat it. You don't have to really eat it. You know, put it in your hand and kind of, you know, spit it out and don't, don't do that. And so what Eleazar says in response to that is, look, such pretense is not worthy of our time of life. 
for many of the young might suppose that Eleazar in his 90th year had gone over to an alien religion and through my pretense, for the sake of living a brief moment longer, they would be led astray because of me while I defile and disgrace my old age. And so, so he refuses to do that and he is massacred. Um, and, the, and that continues on, and there are several other martyrs that are listed. In fact, probably one of the most um, stirring and memorable, uh, certainly most remarked upon passages from Second Book of Maccabees uh, is a group of seven brothers and their mother who are arrested and brought before King Antiochus IV. He again orders them to eat pork. In other words, conform to this law of uh, Hellenizing law and a, an elimination of their uh, customs, and when they refuse, uh, one after another, each in speeches, he tortures them and he kills them until um, even there's only one left, and the mother's saying, urging him on to also be martyred, and he's, he um, is killed, and then she dies. So uh, a, a bunch of um, martyrs for the cause. And in this book now then, because of these kind of martyrs, that sets off outrage, that sets off the rebellion. And so the action now shifts to the countryside where Judas Maccabeus organizes an army and he starts uh, a rebellion. He starts seizing territory. The rebels have a lot of military success, so they defeat local Seleucid armies while the king is off away campaigning in Persia. And after more fighting, uh, Judas Maccabeus conquers Jerusalem. Uh, purifies the temple, and as we saw in the first book, also establishes the festival of Hanukkah. And so this is the account in 2 Maccabees of the purification of the temple. We read, Now Maccabeus and his followers, the Lord leading them on, recovered the temple and the city. They tore down the altars that had been built in the public square by the foreigners and also destroyed the sacred precincts. They purified the sanctuary and made another altar of sacrifice. Then striking fire out of flint, they offered sacrifices after a lapse of two years, and they offered incense and lighted lamps and set out the bread of the presence. When they had done this, they fell prostrate and implored the Lord that they might never again fall into such uh, misfortunes, but that if they should ever sin, they might be disciplined by him with forbearance and not be handed over to blasphemous and barbarous nations. So their covenant here is sort of like, we don't want this to happen to us again. We don't want to you know, have, have be scattered or whatever. But think of some other way to punish us, as, as, us next time as the, anyway, the, the uh, theology both of the, of the book of Maccabees here anyway. Um, so it happened that on the same day uh, on which the sanctuary had been profaned by the foreigners, the purification of the sanctuary took place. That is, on the 25th day of the same month, which was Shislev. So they celebrated it for eight days with rejoicing, therefore carrying ivy-wreathed ivy wands and beautiful branches and also fronds of palm. They offered hymns of thanksgiving to him who had given success to the purifying of his own holy place. They decreed by public edict, ratified by vote, that the whole nation of the Jews should observe these days every year. So this is the establishment of the festival of Hanukkah. Um, so from this, there are more victories against the Seleucids. So although Antiochus IV has died, um, and in fact in the text here, um, he's cursed with illness and so forth by God. Um, so there's more intervention in the second book of Maccabees, more divine intervention than in the first book of Mac Maccabees, where um, the author is more writing it in the form of a uh, a kind of a Greek history, so it has less, even though it's a little, it's, it's less like a biblical model and more like um, a contemporary Greek history, but in this case, uh, for Second Maccabees, it's a little bit more uh, divine intervention. So Antiochus' successors continue to send armies to subdue the rebels, and so at the Battle of Adassa in 161 BCE, uh, Judas Maccabeus again defeats another Seleucid army who is under the command of Nicanor, who is a Nicanor, who is the governor, uh, the Seleucid governor who's supposed to be ruling Jerusalem, and they also end up killing him. Uh, and so this is where the book of Sac Second Maccabees ends while the rebellion is still ongoing. 
So to sum up, uh, the second book of Maccabees, although Hellenization is still central to the narrative, um, as we kind of saw already, the story is more nuanced than in the first book of Maccabees. So infighting among a Hellenized Jewish elite in Jerusalem is what actually leads to Antiochus sacking the temple on his way back from his invasion of Egypt. And we also see that syncretization of religion was a general trend in the Hellenistic world, um, which was resonating with some of the Jewish elite, and obviously it was not resonating with others of them. So 2 Maccabees then is a very interesting second version of the story, which is more taking uh, Bible as a model in the sense that it sees God as more directly intervening in all of the events. So I want to, um, having kind of gone in detail about what the book says, both of those two books say, those two pictures, I want to look a little bit, um, and as we're concluding here, in the uh, chronology of the Hasmonean period overall. And so I've created a um, little timeline here that is going from uh, this period when uh, Antiochus uh, III takes Jerusalem in the first place, which brings... Um, the Judeans from the orbit of the Ptolemies and brings them into uh, the Seleucid orbit. So that period begins actually a relatively um, harmonious period. So despite the fact that uh, the books of Maccabees see Antiochus IV, his successor, as uh, a person who is um, very much pushing Hellenism and uh, persecuting Jews and outlawing uh, their um, customs and law and everything like that, uh, his predecessor, Antiochus III, actually had a completely opposite policy. So his policy uh, involved including um, included sending funds to help uh, repair the temple after um, uh, recent conflicts that they'd had in the war between himself and the Ptolemies, and also affirmed uh, the rights of Judeans throughout his empire to uh, be able to practice their own customs and laws and so forth. Uh, and so his policy in general, even though there was always a policy of promoting Hellenism, so anybody who um, you know wanted to be in the cities to take part in speaking Greek, being uh, in Greek schools, Greek customs, uh, Greek learning, and so forth, there was nevertheless a pragmatism through the Seleucid Empire where locals were allowed to maintain their local laws and customs and so forth as well. So the change of that, as we kind of see, happens in this warfare that occurs between his successor Antiochus IV and the Ptolemies when Antiochus sacks Jerusalem in 168. That sets off the Maccabean revolt. You can kind of see the period of that revolt from 161 to 141 BCE. Fairly soon into that is the rededication of the Second Temple in 164 and the establishment of Hanukkah. And then you can see um, uh, after the um, the other brothers, so after uh, Judas Maccabeus' death and his other brothers, it comes down to uh, Simon Thassi, who's the last of the brothers, and then his son takes over as the Maccabean leader, the ethnarch and high priest, John Hyrcanus I. So he has a good long reign. His son Aristobulus I has a brief reign, and then it goes to his brother Alexander, then uh, their widow, Salome Alexandra, and then, and then the dynasty starts to break down uh, under her children uh, in the 60s, in other words, in the, in the 6th century there. So in the middle of that, um, it goes from being people that are in a bit of, a bit of revolt to in 141, as the Seleucids Empire continues to collapse, they have more autonomy as ethnarchs to the time where you get to like 110, and they achieve actual independence. By 104, they are claiming the title of Basileus, which is Greek for king. So now at that point, it's an independent kingdom for a brief sort of 40 years, because at that point, um, in 63 BCE, the Romans uh, defeat the Seleucids and eliminate the Seleucid kingdom, which they simply annex as a province of the Roman Empire. And at that very same moment in 63, Judea becomes a Roman protectorate. And so although the um, Hasmonean kingdom continues in name, it is now uh, not sovereign or independent. It's a dependent kingdom on the Romans. 
And indeed, um, as we've seen in our lecture on Herod the Great, at a certain point, um, the Romans decide to replace the Hasmonean dynasty with uh, the dynasty of their, um, one of their chief nobles, uh, the Idumean leader, Herod. So just to, as a, by way of just going through that kind of context, so although the Seleucids, they're initially the primary successor to Alexandria, and you can kind of see their empire going across almost the whole course of the Persian Empire from the Aegean uh, across uh, Anatolia, Syria, Mesopotamia, Babylon, Persia, and all the way into Bactria, Bactria Afghanistan. Their empire um, slowly collapsed, and as it collapsed, it left vacuums of power, including ultimately in Judea, on the frontier between the Seleucids in Syria and Ptolemaic Egypt. Um, so when we see the context of the Maccabean Revolt from that giant empire, by the time we get down to 124 BCE, uh, Seleucia is just a rump kingdom. It just consists essentially of, of the kingdom of Syria, along with Lebanon and Israel, Palestine, and so forth. That sort of area, as you can kind of see, including Cilicia in, in Anatolia. And so the autonomy and independence of Hasmonean Judea is set against this backdrop of that collapse. Um, by the time the Seleucids lost Anatolia to Rome and her allies in 188, they lost Persia and Mesopotamia to the Parthians by 129, and eventually, like I say, it's just a rump state which the Romans annex in 63. So during that collapse, um, there is, though, some pretty impressive uh, expansion. So the last of Judas Maccabeus' brothers to reign as high priest and ethnarch, as I mentioned, is Simon Thassi. And so he had this... Um, uh, uh, in, this, in this map here, we have um, in green the area uh, under that, you know, that at, at the time of Simon Thassi, and then when his son takes over, he conquers this purple region all around it. So in the first year of his reign, um, Antiochus VII lay siege to Jerusalem and exacted a very heavy tribute. So um, the autonomy was sort of almost completely diminished. He wasn't able to destroy Jerusalem, so they continued to be autonomous, but they nevertheless had to pay a very heavy tribute. Uh, and John Hyrcanus, for example, had to break open um, King David's tomb and take all of the gold out as a tribute. And so that was not popular, a popular move, but they preserved their autonomy. But then as the Seleucids collapsed further into civil war, uh, John regained his autonomy and, like I say, began conquering all of these territories. So south of Judea, the area called Idumea, and that's the area that Herod and his father were from, and north of Judea, the area of Samaria. And uh, then under his son, Aristobulus I, um, the Hasmoneans successfully asserted their independence, and they assumed the title of Basileus, as I say, king. So in addition to being the high priest, they're also the king. And so after his death, Aristobulus is succeeded by his brother, Alexander Janaeus, who expands the kingdom to its maximum extent. So you can see that he inherited the green area, and they add uh, the purple areas around the frontier, much more of the coast, and further down into southern Idumea and more area across uh, the Jordan. Um, and so, like I say, this is set against a backdrop where the Seleucids and the Ptolemies are both rapidly declining in the face of ever growing Roman power. So simultaneously as this happens, the Hasmoneans are also transforming their cultural outlook. So they began as rural traditional priests and they move into becoming Hellenistic kings. In just three generations, um, they kind of cease promote traditionalism and they start adopting even their names. So their names, as we've been reading here, are things like Aristobulus, which means in Greek, best advising, and Alexander, so it's just named, obviously, in, uh, after Alexander. So um, opposition, because of that, to Hasmonean high priesthood and kingship became organized in Judea in schools like the Essenes. Uh, and so the Essenes wanted to purify the priesthood. They wanted to, um, to have the kingdom be, again, not Hellenized and so forth. And so they withdraw to uh, their... Uh, kind of quasi-monastic place next to the Dead Sea in Qumran, 
where they anticipate that eventually God is going to uh, cause there to be a restoration. And then also uh, more moderate reformers, the scribes who organize as the Pharisees, who seek uh, uh, reformation by reinterpreting uh, the law and so forth. So meanwhile, as we kind of even see in this map, the Romans continue to encroach. And so as the Romans continue to annex territories, the Hasmonean kingdom is growing as Ptolemies and the, Tol and the Seleucids are, are shrinking. But all of these successor states, including uh, the Hasmoneans, become subject to the decrees of the Roman Senate, which is also expecting bribes from everybody and is also intervening um, mostly in ways that support Roman interests as opposed to whatever the local interests are. So the Roman Republic became the leading power in the Mediterranean in the second and first centuries of the B BCE. Increasingly, Rome intervened in the affairs of Greeks and the Hellenistic kingdoms, and Roman senators competed for power within the Republic by raising loyal armies and conquering new territories. And so uh, Rome is not an empire yet, but one of the ways that uh, the nobles, the senators, are able to make names for themselves and assume leadership and so forth is that they get named a governor, like you're going to be named governor of Gaul, like Caesar, and then he goes and conquers all the surrounding Gallic tribes in order to massively expand. Uh, you know, he gets reputation as a as a commander. Uh, he uh, has a reputation for victory, and he also adds territory to Rome. So likewise. Um, uh, um, Caesar's rival, Pompey, is made um, governor of the east, and he goes and takes over, uh, conquers, for example, the Seleucids, and adds Syria now to the Roman Empire as, as a province and so forth. And this is simply a way that Roman nobles are competing for power and influence and also get to plunder a lot of um, treasuries and so forth when you, when you conquer places. So Pompey the Great, one of Rome's leading senators, the greatest general, uh, and one of its greatest generals, conquered the Seleucid Kingdom. They annexed it uh, as the Roman province of Syria. And, and later that year, Pompey heads south to Jerusalem. He sacks the city and the temple. The Hasmonean king, Hyrcanus II, is forced to agree to become a Roman client, and that therefore ended the brief stint, maybe 40 years, of uh, the Ju Hasmonean Kingdom of Judea's independence. Hasmonean Judea instantly fell from its height back to kind of a poor rump kingdom that now required Roman approval for important decisions. Ultimately, the Romans decide to depose Hyrcanus II, and they later allow him to resume his position as high priest, but deny him the title king, Basileus, and instead he goes back to being called Ethnarch uh, from 47 uh, to 40 uh, BCE. In 40, the Parthians, so this Persian-speaking, uh, Iranian language speaking successor to the Persians actually invade uh, the Roman province of Syria and with Parthian support, uh, the Hasmonean prince Antigonus II uh, seizes the throne of Judea and switches its allegiance from Rome to Parthia. However, the very next year, Mark Antony, uh, Roman general, drives the Parthians out and Jerusalem's reconquered by the Romans. And so in response uh, to the Hasmonean alliance with the Parthians, Antony is persuaded to name one of their lieutenants, essentially the head of an Idumean noble family who had been uh, uh, serving as a procur procurator and so forth, a lower Roman official. Uh, he decide, they decide to name him king, uh, and to gain legitimacy in his subject's eyes, Herod does marry a Hasmonean princess, um, and with Roman help during a three years war, he defeats the forces of Antigonus II, and he begins to rule as king of Judea and as a Roman client. We've had, like I say, a whole um, lecture on Herod, but this kind of brings the Maccabee story up to that lecture. So to conclude, um, first and second Maccabees tell the story of a revolt, uh, which is a political revolt, but it's also a cultural revolt against Hellenism. Um, but in both of those cases, it's not only a revolt against the, um, the Seleucid uh, overlords, but it's also a civil war between uh, local Hellenized Jews and traditionalist Jews. Um, the war in the books, we only take it to the point where um, the Maccabees achieve essentially a limited autonomy for Judea, but as we see from that 
the history continues on until there is a short-lived independent kingdom. All of that takes place in the context of the collapse of the Seleucids, and for, in that way the Hasmoneans are able to gain independence, uh, after which Rome then assumes control of the entire eastern Mediterranean. And so that is our look at the apocryphal books of Maccabees. And we'll see if Mike has been uh, getting your guys' questions and assembling them so that I can maybe take some of these questions. Um, so Lorenzo Sleestack in Traverse City, Michigan says, I believe the Ethiopians and Eritreans even have their own unique books of Maccabees in the Gies language. So yeah, if they, they do have a bunch of their own Bible books, and so they could have additional Maccabee books. Um, I, I'm not aware of those, if so. There are, like I say, there are kind of eight, at least eight books of Maccabees, and there's a couple more, but, um, but I'm not sure of any of those. But anyway, we'll, we'll have to look them up, and I'll be interested to kind of find out about any of those. There are a bunch of other books in the Ethiopian and Eritrean Orthodox canon, though, as you say. Bob Garrison uh, in Rancho Cucamonga says, is rabbinic Judaism what is practiced today? Yes. So almost all of um, the different modern uh, expressions of Judaism that we will be aware of all are all uh, evolving out of and are all part of rabbinic Judaism. So in North America, you know, we have Reform Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, Conservative Judaism, and Hasidic Judaism and so forth, these are all coming out of um, rabbinic Judaism. So there is the main exception that um, we'll have heard of, uh, you know, that is still existing are the Samaritans. And so that is coming out of an earlier, you know, expression of, you know, of Israelitism. So we were talking about how um, in this book of Maccabees, they also uh, Samaria is in between Galilee and Judea, and Samaria has its own temple on Mount Jezirim, and that is one of the places where um, Antiochus IV also um, made the uh, made that temple a uh, a temple to Zeus, or syncretized the temple there with Zeus. When the Maccabees take over Samaria, they destroy that temple. <laughs> so um, it's not a um, the um, Judeans and Samaritans, Jews and Samaritans, have not been always on good terms as a result of, uh, you know, a lot of times you are, um, you are like your cousins least well. And so uh, in our church, I'm from Community of Christ, the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So our, our biggest fighting is with the Mormons, right? So our LDS cousins and so forth. Uh, but yes, almost all, um, almost all of Judaism that you'd be aware of is, is out of rabbinic Judaism now. Andrew uh, Suriale in Indonesia says, um, no, I'm just going to thank you. Oh, wait, no. First off, I'll thank you for your contribution. And then he says, given uh, the centrality of both the Hanukkah miracle and the martyrdom of the brothers to rabbinic Judaism, what canonical source are the rabbis using if they are not including the Maccabees books? So, um, so... Rabbinic Judaism includes um, later writings of the rabbis in the force, form of um, uh, like the Talmud and other, other later writings, which include um, some of these stories. And so, for example, uh, the Hanukkah story and also the, um, the story, a version of the, the story of the martyrs uh, are, are in those sources, which will have been based on the, the Maccabees, the books of Maccabees. Um, the the my understanding of it is within the um, the Jewish version, it's it's the the martyrs are being not forced to eat pork, but are being forced to worship an idol. And so, in other words, there's a little bit different way of telling the story, but it will have had the it will have had the same source. Um, so yes, but without using um, the books of Maccabees, and in general, uh, rabbinic Judaism, I think, was trying to get away from um, sources that are Greek because of uh, again the fact that the Christians had sort of grabbed all the Greek and Hellenistic stuff, and, uh, and this is kind of a rejection of all of that. And Andre uh, Moray in northeastern Brazil writes, I love history for the way it teaches us what is happening today uh, did happen in the past. Um, how would John link the narrative of the Maccabee revolts in terms of modern revolts? 
Well, um, hmm, interesting. <laughs> so, so one of the one of the links that seems obvious that people um, have have made several times is since this is uh, the last time for any um, any length of time has there been a uh, you know more than a year or two anyway in, during uh, during active revolts. This is the only time where in in the present day where there has been a um, independent uh, Jewish state in the land of Judea, and so that is sometimes then uh, compared to the Maccabean revolt, since this is um, the last major time when some of those kind of things have existed. Um, par part of the difference is that even though there is this tension between um, traditional Judaism and, and and Hellenism, which involves um, Let's say imposing some of the syncretic practices of Hellenism in, involves ending or proscribing uh, some of the Jewish law and customs and so forth. There is not a background of that um, in the Greek for the Greeks of that era in what has become like sort of let's say the modern anti-Semitism. So modern anti-Semitism in advance of the of the Holocaust. Um, Includes all kinds of um, like racist pseudoscience um, uh, of um, just just totally uh, false but hateful theories of, um, that are denigrating um, uh, Jewish people racially and so forth. That it was part of the justification for the atrocities, um, and that does not exist in um, in essentially Hellenistic or or or. Uh, Greek philosophy at the time, and so there are, are contemporary um, Greek philosophers who are looking at the history of the Jewish people and saying, hey, they have a very similar history to us. We both, they came out of Egypt. Um, we have uh, ancient Greeks who also, in our mythology, um, came out of Egypt and learned from Egypt. Uh, we have great lawgivers like Solon, who established our customs and they have great antiquity and so forth and, and uh, rationality behind them. Uh, likewise, the Jewish people have uh, Moses, great lawgiver and so forth. And indeed, um, from that kind of um, um, understanding that, um, again, like a Greek philosopher had, uh, many Hellenized uh, Jewish thinkers kind of built on that. As we've seen, we had a whole lecture on Philo of Alexandria who sort of uh, uh, builds on that and sees Moses as uh, as a philosopher, and interprets Moses as a as a precursor to Greek philosophy, um, and we've also and we're going to have another whole lecture on um, Josephus, who is trying to do the same kind of things. So I would say that in those cases, um, that parallel, which is often made, uh, isn't quite um, doesn't quite match up because uh, the. This would be the very beginnings of a kind of persecution of Jews for religious customs, almost the first time that that happens. And it's a much more elaborated, obviously, when we get to um, 20th and 21st century uh, anti-Semitism. In terms of other kinds of revolts in modern times, you know, the, I mean, there, there are, the, everything is so very different now in terms of um, the authority and capacity that states have. There's so much control that everybody has over, over information, over economy, and all these things. In the ancient times, um, everything is, is so, there's so much less built environment, and so it's easier to simply protest and run off into the countryside and be outlaws for a whole long time than it is for a whole kind of region to do that <laughs> these days. Um, so. So in some sense, there's, it's harder to draw, draw parallels for how the revolt kind of functioned um, with what can function in, in contemporary times. Mike Karpowitz here at Center Place asks, beyond the many books of the Maccabees that you discuss in this lecture, are there other ancient sources which corroborate or conflict with these historical narratives about the period? So yes, um, we don't have... Um, so we don't have as detailed uh, a sources outside of this kind of source. But so for example, I mentioned how in um, the first book of Maccabees, uh, it 
is describing the Antiochus IV as, as having a decree, a general policy. He's going to Hellenize everybody in his entire kingdom, and he's going to suppress all local customs everywhere. There are simply um, no ancient sources from anywhere else in the Seleucid kingdom that suggest that any such thing happens. So it's a... Um, so it does conflict with that, you know, and so there, uh, so in that sense, always when we are reading these sources, we have to read with the, we have to remember that the author is writing with their own perspective, they have their own biases, there are, are obviously, they're writing after the fact, and they are, and when you're doing that, you're in creating anachronisms, and they're looking at it through their lens. And so the, the specific um, lens of both of these authors, which is to try to um, really emphasize uh, the, the forced Hellenization, um, does seem to um, belie what we see in the other sources where we are finding that actually there is a, it, this is a civil conflict. There are lots and lots of um, uh, Jewish people at the time, especially including the elites, who have Hellenized and who are wanting to Hellenize, and it's much less a um, uh, like the cause of a, an outside cause of rebellion than a civil war that's happening inter internally. Daryl Scott in Wisconsin writes, um, how would ordinary people in Judea have experienced Hellenization and dehellenization? Would they have even cared much? Um, so ordinary people, you say, as opposed to the elites. So it would be the elites that are taking, that are probably learning Greek, that are taking... Um, Greek names and that are, are in the gymnasium and studying and things like that. And so in terms of the, um, the ordinary people, um, so a difference, I guess, with how they would be potentially experiencing it is that uh, they're setting up new shrines. So there would be maybe new religious shrines that are appearing. Um, there are different taxes. There would be um, maybe suppression of uh, of traditional festivals, so you might have um, always had a, a activity where you, you know, don't work on the Sabbath, you don't work on on uh, Saturday, but now suddenly um, a new landlord says, "Well, we're not following that anymore." So now you do have to work on Saturday. You might win like that. So, so an ordinary person um, might have had those kind of experiences with it, and in general. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why we kind of kind of looked at this as maybe a um, kind of a rural versus urban um, conflict too is that it maybe isn't affecting you that much, but you maybe are um, always you know, as a rural person you may might feel looked down upon by the the city people and have some resentments, and so there might um, which is kind of a natural uh, human nature throughout all of kind of human history. So I want to, I think that's the end of the questions, but I want you guys to save the date for our upcoming lectures. So on June 6, like I say, we're going to look at the second book of Enoch, Secrets of Enoch, it's called. On June 13th, we're going to look at Josephus. And so Josephus is one of our other sources for this period. He's relying a little bit on these books of Maccabees or some of them, but he also has access to other sources. So it's going to cover some of the same period. Uh, but he also t uh, talks a lot more and knows more about the first century of the common era, the Christian era, A.D., uh, June 13th, that is. On June 27th, we're going to look at the Emperor Constantine and how that changed all of history. And then on July 4th, we're going to look at why is Jesus from Galilee. Uh, seems strange <laughs> that that should be the case. And also, though, the fact that he's from a strange place may have had a bunch of interesting effects on the background of the historical Jesus. So thank you so very much, and we'll say goodbye, and thanks, Mike, for being uh, filling in for Leandro as our producer tonight.